Well, again, good morning. Welcome to Ashton Valley Calvary Chapel. And folks, it really is all about Jesus. And I'm excited today. I just sense uh, there's a real buzz today. And what I mean by that, just I think there's an expectation of, of just, aren't you excited to spend time with the Lord today? Just to worship, to get into his word. And um, I just sense that our hearts here today that are looking forward to that, you know, and that's why we come. We don't do this as a ritual. We don't come together just to, uh, hey, fulfill a quota. I've appeased God today. No, we've come to seek the living God and to worship him and to spend time in his word and to pray. And I'm so thankful that you guys have all chosen to be a part of it today. So, again, welcome. And uh, I'm excited to see what God's got in store. I know he'll meet all of us right where we're at. I pray that we have open hearts to him and that he'll just uh, meet us all right where we're at. So we're going to open in prayer. Javen's going to lead us, and then we'll get started. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for um, this time to worship you. Thank you for this building that we have. And uh, help us not to take it for granted, Lord, that uh, we have this place where we can worship you in safety, Jesus. And um, just help us to get lost in your presence today and to surrender all of our cares and doubts and uh, just uh, put them at the feet of the cross, Lord Jesus. Thank you for... Uh, fact that you even want to have a relationship with us and that you love us and you care about us, Lord Jesus. And, um, thank you for the gift of knowing you and for your grace and for the sacrifice you made on the cross, Jesus, and you paid for each and every one of our sins, Lord, and we just cast our burdens and cares down at your feet, Jesus. So God, we're just so grateful for you and um, just want to worship you now, Lord. We just commit this time to you, and Holy Spirit, please just enter and fill us up, and uh, just fill our hearts, and help us just to sing praises to you, Lord. Pray these things in your name, amen. Amen. Well, you guys can stand or remain seated. The attitude of our hearts is what matters most. We worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Let's seek his face. And I believe you are the way. The truth, the life, and I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, and I believe, see it again, the way, the truth, the life, Lord, I believe you are the way. The truth, the life, and I believe the weather repair, the weather heartbreak, the weather circumstance, and I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, and I believe the weather repair. Weathery heartbreak, weathery circumstance, and I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, and I believe you are. The truth, 
Oh, 
come up, church, sing it again. Oh, what a say.
faithfulness, Lord. We stand in awe of you today. We thank you for this amazing privilege of joining our hearts before your very throne, God, to sing your praises. Spend this time with you, Lord. Help us to never take for granted this gift. And Lord, we ask that you would actually expand our, our sense and understanding of what it is to be in your presence, Lord, that we would be in increasing awe and wonder of you and your love for us, God. We're just so thankful for who you are and all that you've done. We just ask, Lord, as Rodney leads us in this time of devotion and prayer, we would just continue before your throne, Lord, through the morning with a worshipful attitude now, Lord, at this time. And even when we get into your word, Lord, just in a worshipful posture before you, thanking you, God, that you nourish our souls and our spirits, Lord, through your word. So, God, just continue to be with us now as we just... Join our hearts before your throne in prayer and devotion in Jesus' name. Let's can be seated for devotion and prayer. serve an awesome God, don't we? He's the, uh, the God of all rest, the God of comfort. And in this day and age, um, when we're weary and tired, we need to know that we can go to him and find rest. So today's devotion is rest in Christ. 
Rest is an important aspect of our relationship with God. God shows us this in the very first book of the Bible. In Genesis, after our creator God spoke the heavens and the earth into completion, he saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work of creation. Genesis 2-3 says, Then God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Here he shows us our need for rest and the vital role it plays in all our lives. Rest allows us to move away from our daily activities and busyness so we can focus on him, our God, our creator. In rest, we find peace of mind and we find peace of spirit. Who couldn't use a little more peace in their life, huh? We can be free of our, our anxieties. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. He wants us to set aside regular, meaningful time To put everything in front of him and everything else aside and glorify him with our worship and our praises and our prayers. In the presence of the Lord, the Bible tells us, is the fullness of joy. Resting in God's presence, we find joy. Again, who couldn't use a little more of that? We, the rest has many benefits. And they are that resting in the Lord gives us an eternal perspective that we all need to take on the day, right? It should always remind us that we are pilgrims in this land and this is not our home. We are just passing through to our ultimate destination. That eternal place that our Lord Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. So that where he is, we may also be someday. And I think as we see what's going on around, that someday could be pretty soon. I don't know about you, but that sure gives me a whole lot of hope. To know that we get to leave the craziness and the chaos, sometimes despair that comes with this life far behind someday, and trade it in for our mansions of glory in the eternal presence of our Savior. So you see, resting in the Lord gives us hope of the awesome things that await us. Rest not only gives us perspective, but it allows us to push the busyness of life aside and focus on our Lord and Savior. To grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus, to experience the refreshment he brings us, he is the living water of life. He truly is. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And through him, we see in Hebrews 4, 9 through 10, the word says, so there is a special rest still awaiting for the people of God. For all who have, sent, who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. When we focus on Jesus, we are reminded of all that he is doing and that he is the author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith. As we rest in Christ, we are reminded of Philippians 1.6. 
where the Apostle Paul tells us, and I am certain that God, who began a good work in you, will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is meant to be encouraging. I hope that encourages you all. It sure does me. Jesus has a plan for each one of us that he is actively involved in, in our lives, completing, making us more like himself, like Jesus Christ, and that we will come to, to, and that will come to fruition on the day that Jesus returns for his bride, the church. The fact that Jesus will return, and again, it appears that that day is someday soon. That should fill our hearts with songs of gladness, says the psalm say. Rest also reminds us that we serve the Lord, that there are no bad days, only that some days are better than others, and that we are privileged to call the very creator of the universe our God and our Heavenly Father. How awesome is that? We are assured that we can find rest because we have the Spirit within us, the Savior above us, and the Word before us. And through these supernatural gifts working together on our behalves, on each one of our behalves, we can know the peace that surpasses all understanding and the rest and trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Finally, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, we can understand that the more we surrender our will to Christ, the more spiritual rest we will find. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and in me you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Please pray with me. Father God, you are so good. And we are so privileged uh, to be considered children, your children, Lord, because of Jesus Christ, to know him as Lord and Savior. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us. Help us to be thankful in all times, no matter what difficulties and challenges we may face. To know that we share life with Jesus and we are yoked alongside of him, as the word tells us. To always remember that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Thank you that you pick us up and restore us when we stumble clean us off, you set us onto the path of righteousness. You help us to often stop all the business, Lord, in our lives and just look and rest in you. Only you can truly remove the pressures of this life and our self-dependence. Help us not be dependent on ourselves, Lord but to be dependent fully on you. We pray that your will will take the place of the many demands and challenges this life puts on us and help us to face the struggles and difficulties and the circumstances that we have created ourselves by remembering that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You are the answer when facing chaos and despair. Help us not to turn from you in shame 
and move to isolation, but rather to run into the loving arms of you, our Lord and Savior, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and the one who we find the ultimate rest in. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Oh, amen. Thank you very, very much, Rodney. Good stuff, bro. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, that was a blessing, huh? Man, that concentrated time in God's presence is uh, always, always wonderful. Um, can I tell you guys something? I love you guys. <laughs> you know what? I, wow, praise the Lord. What a great church family we have. And, uh, you know, I was gone last week at the Calvary Canyon Hills in California and leading worship there. And, and you know what? Anytime I'm away guest teaching somewhere or leading worship, I always miss you guys. I always miss being here with my church family. And those are wonderful fellowships and stuff. But, you know, it's always good to come home. And it's good to see you guys this morning. I appreciate your hearts for the Lord. I appreciate your hearts for this church family. And it's just a blessing. We have a, a wonderful, wonderful body of believers here. And I just want to let you guys know that I appreciate you and I love you. And it's just wonderful to be a part of this church family. Amen? That's the way I feel anyway. So uh, some quick announcements, guys. Uh, of course, this Sunday, we've got one service. As you guys know, you're here, 10 o'clock. Next Sunday, same thing, a 10 o'clock service. The last Sunday of the month, two services again. 9 and 11, and both of those will be family services. I'd mentioned, or we've been sharing with you guys uh, the last few weeks, that for the first few months of the year, that's how we're going to do it. The first three Sundays will be one at 10 o'clock. Then the last Sunday of the month will be two services at 9 and 11 with no children's ministry. Those will be family Sundays. And the real reason behind that, again, is because uh, we're just praying for the Lord to raise up more people to serve in our children's ministry so we have enough of a rotation to get back to where we were. And as you guys know, we've lost a lot of people to relocations. It's had an impact on our uh, church family in that regard. But you know what? What do you do? You're flexible. You make the adjustments that you need to as you fluidly work your way through stuff, and it's working out great. And uh, looking forward to another opportunity to have some family service. So keep that in mind. Next week, 10 o'clock. Then the following Sunday on the 27th, 9 and 11, no children's ministry, so we'll be together here. And also, on that day of the 27th, during the 11 o'clock service, there will be some servant training for those who are involved in children's ministry. Uh, my wife will be leading that next door, so we'll be in here. So if you're going to be part of that, you need to come to the 9 o'clock service then you can be part of the training at 11. Who's supposed to be here for that? Anybody that's involved in children's ministry? Or? Okay. All right, because we do have some newer people who are stepping into that. Some even gone through background checks and stuff. So if you are part of that and you're going to be serving coming up, you need to attend that on the 27th during the 11 o'clock service next door. If you're feeling the Lord is speaking to your heart about being involved or if you have some questions and wonder what it looks like to be part of our children's ministry team, then attend that as well. That would be a great opportunity to check that all out. So that will be on the 27th. And then what do you have here in February? Of course, again, 10 a.m., the 3rd, the 10th, the 17th, and again on the 24th, the 4th Sunday on the 24th. So, all right, we're in good shape there. Uh, just to put it on the radar, by the way, uh, you know, before we know it, resurrection season will be here. So on April the 21st, folks, we are going to be back at the UNA Conference Center. Last year, we ho hosted two services here, and uh, it was interesting because one of the reasons we did that, it was the weekend of spring break. When it happens, a lot of families are gone anyway. This year, it's late enough in the spring, Resurrection Sunday is, that we won't have that issue. So we're going to be having seating for 500 at the UNA Conference Center on April the 21st. Be praying about that. That's a major outreach opportunity. So be praying about inviting people. Be praying for the Lord to draw people in our community who may not know him. And, of course, there will be a clear presentation of Jesus' love for us, the gospel, what it is to know him, to have eternal life, and the celebration of the reality that he is risen. Amen? And if it wasn't for him being risen, hey, this is just a social gathering, but it's not. Jesus is alive, and he's at work in the hearts and lives of his people. Also, our Calvary Connection small groups, they're all back on track. A Tuesday night, the IHOP crew at Bob and Kim Barton's, that means 55 and older, right? <laughs> and these guys usually have dinner, okay? I, I'm in the countdown mode. I'm like 11 months away from being able to attend the IHOP crew, right? <laughs> so 6.30. Bob and Kim Bartons. Wednesday night, we're back in our adult study in the book of Revelation. We'll be in chapter uh, 9 coming up here. 
and we're looking forward to that. Our youth groups back on track Wednesday nights. We uh, worship at 6.30, then at 7 o'clock, adults, we go into the coffee house. Youth goes next door. Thursday nights, women's study at 6 o'clock. My wife hosts that at our home, and they had a great turnout last Thursday. Off to a great start there. Men's ministry, Friday mornings at 6 a.m. here in the coffee house. We're uh, doing a reboot of the study we've been doing. And so if you haven't been a part of that, then get involved, guys. We've got some more resources for you guys, and we're doing a study based on Micah 6.8, and it's called A Life Well Lived. It's really, really powerful. So that's every Friday at 6 a.m. except the second week of each month, and yesterday was that second week, and we had a men's breakfast at 8 o'clock on Saturday, and we just had a great time of fellowship. So keep that in mind. Then Friday nights, the study in First Peter, uh, Rob Evans, who taught last week when I was gone, on the true faith, which was a very powerful message, he teaches that study, and where are, there you go, right back there. You and your wonderful wife, Janelle, Javen and Janelle Carter host that. Is that a 6.30 start time? Okay, so uh, all that information is available on Facebook as well. So guys, there's wonderful opportunities outside of just Sunday mornings to connect and to grow and to fellowship. It's always a wonderful, wonderful thing. So before we dismiss the fourth and fifth graders and the middle school and junior high, I want you guys to stay in here. Tithe reports. Thank you very much. As soon as you wave, and I can see the green thing. Uh, Katrina is our head of our treasury team, and she has all of the tithing and giving statements from 2018 available back on the offering table. You'll see a box sitting there. It's got the green emblem that says tithing reports, right? So make sure you pick those up, folks. Uh, we'll mail out what we need to, but it saves money if you'll go ahead and look through there and grab yours. So we'll give two or three weeks, and then whatever's left, we'll go ahead and put them in the mail. But so check that out before you get out of here. And we appreciate your thoughtful uh, and faithful investment in the life of this ministry and this church family. So again, before we dismiss those kids, I want to share something with you guys. It's very, very powerful. You know, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the way God is moving in the hearts and lives of our young people in our church. Uh, the kids, our youth, and our young adults. And uh, I had mentioned that we've got four of our young adults who will be leaving in less than a month to spend a semester of study in Israel at the Calvary Chapel Bible College up in the Golan, which is pretty <laughs> interesting, and it's going to be very powerful. So be praying for those guys. We'll have two that are back in Marietta again for the spring semester, and so that's going to be awesome. We're going to have six of our young people all in Calvary Chapel Bible College at one time, four in Israel, two back in Marietta, and then, of course, there are some who are already filling out applications, so when they graduate from high school, they'll be going this coming fall as well. So it's a wonderful time to see what God's doing. Then we've got some other wonderful young adults in our fellowship who are attending Christian schools. Not Calvary chapels, but they're attending Christian schools. We know Isaiah is out at Sterling College, a Christian college, playing football out there, and he was home for Christmas. It was wonderful to see him. And then we know uh, Linda's wonderful daughter. Why am I drawing a blank? Carly. Yeah, I'm getting old. Er, <laughs> heavy on the er, right? And she's in a Christian school up in Washington pursuing nursing. So it's just exciting to see stuff. And, and one of the neat things that's going on, folks, you know that we have an active missions program. Typically, we send a team to Guatemala every summer, and uh, typically we have a team that goes to Arizona to work with special needs people. So we're always praying about opportunities for missions. And I just want to let you guys know, for some of you that you might know this, that our daughter Paige is with a group right now from the Bible College. They're in the Philippines. They arrived two days ago. They're working at an orphanage there. It's a very wonderful work that God is doing. And you know what we're praying about, but the potential of being involved in that as well, because the cost for 10 days in the Philippines is very comparable to what it costs to go to Guatemala. And so we want to share just a little clip here of where they're at, this Calvary Chapel orphanage. There's a wonderful guy who's in his mid-70s now that went over 30 years ago, him and his wife, to, for ministry, and the Lord has done some amazing things as they've reached out to the orphans in the community. You'll see that God has provided some amazing stuff for them. So they've got about 170 kids at the orphanage right now that they minister to, and that's where Paige and these guys are involved right now. There's a Christian school that God has raised up there as well, and a Calvary Chapel church there. It's just amazing what the Lord has done in Bacola. So let's share that video real quick, and I hope this is inspiring as you can be praying for these guys. And then for you, you teenagers who have an opportunity to go on missions trips, these are life-changing. They're really powerful. So let's check this out real quick. 
hope you always feel loved and you always feel blessed That life's more fun than you ever could have guessed Hope you know from the start just how great God thinks you are Calvary Kids is a children's home in the Philippines, but instead of seeing ourselves as an institution, we try to resemble a large family, and by God's grace, it works. Some folks think having 175 kids can be hard. Buying gas can be a challenge. True, making a grocery list is a little time-consuming. We eat lots of fruits and veggies. 500 pounds of potatoes a month, not to mention meats and poultry. Each month we consume 3,000 bananas. In the Philippines, there is always fresh fish for sale. We enjoy fresh milk from our own dairy cows, make cheeses and delicious ice cream in our dairy. We even make soaps from our cow's milk bake our own fresh breads and rolls. When we get sick, we need medicines. Each of us gathered together to start the day in God's Word. This morning, Terry Rotherham leads our devotions. Terry's been here since 1993 and is a blessing from the Lord. Then to end the day, we enjoy evening devotions with songs, memory verse, and just plain fun in the Lord. Once or twice a month, to the kids' delight, we have picnics and movies with our family under the stars. We serve the Lord with gladness as one big family in Christ. When the Lord calls us home to heaven, we will be laid to rest in our very own memorial garden. We had so many kids in 1995, God called us to start a school for the children, Calvary Chapel Christian School. Mornings you'll find our school having flag ceremony, then each student goes to their own classrooms. It's as easy as one, two, three, la da 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 da, easy as A, B, C. You want to know what makes me happy, happy, you want to know Preschool to high school with a special ed class. Most of the teachers are kids that stayed to serve the Lord as missionaries. Hi, I'm Mary Vick. I was a child at Calvary too. Now I'm the principal and a teacher of high school at Calvary Chapel Christian School. Our high school curriculum now offers agriculture and animal husbandry. With a herd of 50 cows, the guys cut grass, muck stalls, and milk our cows all before class begins. Farm fresh milk makes our kids strong and healthy. Carpentry, t-shirt making, construction, needle craft, and making recycled paper for our homemade cards. ABCs to math, sciences to history, geometry, and Bible. All these classes help to educate and equip our kids for their future. Graduation is a very important day for our kids. We have awards, speeches, diplomas, and ribbons. Fun white teal and royal blue caps and gowns are worn by graduates. Excitement, jitters, and a bunch of good memories fill the air, making it a perfect end of school. It's as easy as one, two, three. We like to thank each of you who have stood with us in this great work of the Lord. So be praying for those guys, and the Lord has just provided amazingly for those guys over there. You can even see the facilities. I'm pretty sure that existed beforehand. It's just like the Calvary Chapel Bible College in Marietta. That was a resort years and years ago that uh, had gone unused, and the Lord provided it. And uh, that's where the Calvary Chapel Bible College, the main campus, has been for years and years, and they got it at incredible pricing. And the same kind of a situation there. But uh, pray about whether or not might be uh, a missions opportunity for this fellowship as well. We just want God's will and all that. And then finally, certainly not last, or last but not least, is that how, that, is that how it goes? 
Uh, continue to pray for Savannah Brooke, our wonderful missionary who serves in Italy. She's been there for three years now, and I hope that you guys follow with her on our website and also on Facebook. My wife and I get to talk to her once a month, and of course, her wonderful mother and father are here. You guys know, uh, of course, Garrett is her brother, and he was here uh, two weeks ago. He was able to come and join us and worship and play drums. He lives in Ogden now. But continue to pray for her, and actually there's a new season in her life as she's serving as a missionary representing our church family. She's been in Montebaluna this three years, but the Lord is directing her now to move to the city of Turin or Torino. That's about four hours from uh, Montebaluna, I believe, and it's a huge city. It's about four million people, like the size of Houston, something like that. It's a big, big place, and there's not one Calvary Chapel there. She's going to be a part of a new Calvary Chapel plant there as well, and there's a lot of outreach to Muslims, and of course we know that Savannah has a heart to reach out to the Muslims and the refugees that come into that country of Italy. And she's been, uh, God's used her in amazing ways. We've heard her when she's come and shared about opportunities to share the gospel and people coming to know the Lord. So continue to pray for her. It seems like it'll be the spring when she makes that transition up there. And she'll be visiting with us later on this year. So you guys will have an opportunity coming up here somewhere down the road when she's home to meet her if you haven't and to also hear her as she shares when she comes home. So pray for her. And there are uh, resources on the offering box and also out in the foyer. If you feel compelled to track along with what's going on with her, you can grab those. If you feel compelled to perhaps support her in any way, shape, or form, prayerfully, even financially, but the Lord would lead, then uh, you're welcome to pursue that, okay? So let's dismiss our fourth and fifth grade, middle school and junior high. You guys are welcome to go back to your classes. As they're going back to their classes, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Yep, I said chapter 1. <laughs> Folks, uh, as you know, typically our approach to ministry on Sunday mornings, pulpit ministry, is verse-by-verse -verse study of the Word of God, typically. Now, we do some topical stuff when it's appropriate, and of course, for the last two months, because of Christmas, we did a special series called The Christmas Journey that was, uh, you know, included actually some of Matthew. The last two weeks we had some special teachers. Rob Evans, one of our elders, taught last week, the week before. Uh, Josh Black, who's senior pastor of Calvary Canyon Hills from California, taught a wonderful uh, message as well from First Peter. So now we're going to get back into the Gospel of Matthew, verse by verse, and I'm very excited about this, but it's been a couple of months. And as I was preparing and as I was praying, I really felt like the Lord impressed to, to do a bit of a, a review for highlights in the eight chapters that we've already gone through. There are probably some new to our fellowship that maybe you haven't been a part of this. And uh, if you have been, this refresher will be very, very helpful. We see in God's Word over and over again places where uh, people are reminded of what God's Word says about specific things. So we're going to go over some of the highlights of the first four chapters this morning. Next week, we'll go chapters 5 through 8. That way, we'll have a fresh sense of where, we're, where we've been and where we're going to be going then as we jump back into more of a verse-by-verse -verse approach beginning in chapter 9. And so, as we jump into this, just a quick reminder about the Gospel of Matthew, okay? We know that there are four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three are called synoptic Gospels. Have you ever heard that term before? It means together seeing, sin a synergy, so together and seeing optic. And God inspired, the Holy Spirit moved through these authors to communicate uniquely to certain people groups in that day and age. And it still is appropriate today. For example, the Gospel of Matthew, as we've seen, as what we prefaced when we began the study, was primarily written to appeal to the Jewish people that they would understand that Jesus is the Mashiach, He is the Messiah, He is their God and their King. Come in the flesh, the long-awaited Messiah. So there is a Jewish element of this, certainly through the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Mark was written to appeal more to the Roman culture. And it's a shorter gospel, but it's very action-oriented. It doesn't focus so much on Jesus' teaching as it does his activity and his ministry. So guys, a lot of guys like that. It's like an action movie, right? That's what we like. You know, go in there, get her done kind of stuff. And then the Gospel of Luke was written to appeal to the people of the Greek culture who were very philosophical, uh, you know, very cerebral in their thinking. And so the reality is God meets everybody right where they're at. It was appropriate then, and it's appropriate now how the Lord meets us all through His living and active Word. So as we jump into the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to go through some of the highlights again here of the first four chapters. We're going to begin in verse 1. 
of Matthew 1, and this is what we find. That the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. See, right off the bat, the Gospel of Matthew deals with Jesus' ancestry because the Jewish people knew that when Messiah came, that his lineage would flow from Abraham and also through David. We just came through the Christmas season, right? And how many times did we see in many of the passages from the Old Testament, but also even in Luke's gospel, that he would sit on the throne of his ancestor David, right? So here's the reality. Jesus had to qualify through a legal lineage, and you can trace that all the way back to Abraham when God gave him the Abrahamic covenant that he would bless all the nations through him. What that ultimately meant was when God shared that with Abraham centuries, millennia ago, before even Jesus arrived, that ultimately all the nations would be blessed through Jesus himself, through Messiah. And of course, David, the one who was the king of Israel, and that promise that his ancestor would one day sit on his throne. Remember those passages from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6? That unto us a child is born, a son is given, his humanity and then his deity, Right? and that the government would be upon his shoulders, that he would sit on the ancestor, the throne of his ancestor David. Folks, that reality of him sitting on the throne of his ancestor David is still future. That's prophecy. Now, we came the first time, right? We just came through the Christmas season. That's what that was all about. Is Jesus coming the first time at his advent, his arrival, to come to offer himself ultimately as the Lamb of God, to live a perfect and sinless life? So that's what that was about. But the part about him establishing his kingdom on earth to sit on the throne of his ancestor David, that hasn't happened yet. That is future. But folks, stage setting is underway, preparing for that time when ultimately Jesus will return. And I don't know about you, what an amazing reality that's going to be when Jesus sits on the throne of David, literally from a temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. So the genealogy is very, very important. We're not going to go through all those names. <laughs> if you do read through that, I encourage you to do that. Some names will jump out of there that were part of the Israeli, Israeli or Hebrew history that are very, very important. But we find those generations ultimately lead to Jesus arriving on the scene, and he met the legal qualification through Joseph according to this lineage and ancestry. So let's pick it up in verse 18. And this is what we find the season we just came through, right? The Christmas season. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Mashiach, that's what it means. Jesus would speak of his humanity, and that very name, remember, means the Lord is salvation, Yehoshua, but Christ, Christos, Messiah, that's the divine aspect of Jesus. It was as follows, his arrival, his birth, after his mother Mary was betrothed or engaged, and that was a legal binding contract to Joseph, before they came together and really had life together and all the elements that make up married life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this way. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So this was a miraculous event. As the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and the conception of Jesus' humanity came to be. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away. See, Joseph, when it says he was a just man, that means he was the real deal. He loved the Lord. He was a faithful man of God, and he loved Mary. He loved Mary, and he didn't want to see anything bad happen to her. And by the way, legally, he had the right under Jewish law to have her stoned, to have her executed for adultery. But instead, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to quietly deal with this and actually get a legal divorce according to Jewish custom. But why he was thinking about all this, remember, it says in verse 20, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, right? So his ancestry, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. So the reality of why he came is even declared here. And again, these are all highlights, right? So is this a critical highlight in Matthew chapter 1, the arrival of Jesus 2,000 years ago? Oh, amen, and how, right? Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now remember, that's not just, hey, you know, God's on our side, he's with us. No, that means he's present. Remember in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 
the word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. That's God with us, Emmanuel, and here he is arriving. By the way, I want to point something out when it says in verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled. Matthew points that out regularly through the Gospel of Matthew because, again, prophecy, folks, according to Revelation 19.10, prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And so he points that out, that there were prophecies about the coming Messiah, who is Jesus, and so he's letting them know, hey, here's the reality that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And we see at the conclusion of the chapter that then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded. And he, he commanded him, and he took to him his wife, and he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus, Yeshua. Remember, again, his name means the Lord of salvation. So now we move into chapter 2. And we see some powerful stuff here. I want to let the Word really speak for itself here in this next part of this. By the way, when we see what's happening here in chapter 2, we're about a year, maybe two years removed from Jesus' birth. Folks, the, all the movies that show the three magi showing up that night of Jesus' birth, that's just not biblical. They did not show up that night. They were en route, okay? The Lord was directing them to go where Jesus would be, but you're going to see in the context here that they weren't in a, in a stable and Jesus wasn't in a major, they were in a house. And that's really not that relevant, but just to point out the fact that it was a little while later. So we find in verse 1 of chapter 2, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was about six miles away from Jerusalem, of Judea in the days of Herod the king, now he plays a key role here, Behold, wise men or magi from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Boy, the buzz was out there that Messiah had come. Now Herod, of course, he had ulterior motives, right? He didn't want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. He didn't want anybody competing with his position as the king. When Herod heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ, where Messiah, was to be born. So he said to them, in Be or they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So that's from Micah. And that's prophecy as well about Jesus coming. And isn't it wonderful when it said that he shall come and he'll be a ruler and he will shepherd his people Israel again. A very Jewish aspect of Jesus coming to his own. We find in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, or the magi, he determined from them what time the star had appeared. Now, remember the magi came from the area that we call modern day Iran or Iraq in that general area. And you can trace the lineage of the Magi all the way back to the time of Daniel. So there was probably an influence and a connection there where they had come to know the Scriptures relating to the promises, the prophecies from the Old Covenant about the Messiah. That's why it was relevant to them because they obviously had a knowledge of that. So we find this again in verse 7. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the Magi, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And again, that was a ruse, right? He just wanted to know the location so he could take Jesus out. Verse 9, But when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, that's mobility, folks. Here's an interesting thing. You know, there are people who speculated and have done studies about, okay, maybe it was this star and the way they kind of converged and the way the light shone, that's what God orchestrated. I don't believe that for a second. This thing moved. Those stars in the heavens don't move. My personal perspective is this was the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. You remember the nation of Israel as they were wandering, God led them as a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. This was a mobile thing that literally came and showed them the house to come to. So, you know, we don't have to worry about whether this star aligned or this or that. God had the bases covered. 
And that's just my personal perspective that this was a supernatural thing that God did, illuminated it. And to them, of course, they would have thought, man, look at this thing. It's like a, a, a star. But it was God directing them where they needed to go. So we pick it up then in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, okay, not a stable, not a manger. They had come into the house. They saw the young child. And even the Greek language, that denotes that he's not a baby anymore. So he's probably at least a year old, maybe two years old, and, and we'll see why we have an understanding of that moving forward. So when they'd come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and what did they do? They fell down and they worshipped him. Wow. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And see, that's where uh, the tradition of there being three, right? But the Bible doesn't say that. There were three kings presented. There was probably a major entourage, and there were more probably than just the three guys. They just happened to present three gifts. So sometimes people just kind to kind of you know take artistic license, if you will, to insert things. But here's the reality: there were probably more than that. But they presented gifts. They worshipped. The gold would have represented his kingship and his kingdom. The frankincense. The, the beauty and the wonder of fellowship with God and also of prayer that we get to pray. And then that, the last aspect of that, folks, was myrrh. And that would speak of his sacrifice. Because when Jesus was crucified, they prepared his body with myrrh and aloes. That's what they traditionally did. So there we have those wonderful gifts speaking of Jesus and what he would represent as deity, his also mediation, and then also the reality of his death and his sacrifice for us. Verse 12, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return, that would be the Magi, not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So we continue to track. Now when they had departed, behold an angel of the Lord, remember that's not the angel of the Lord you see in the Old Covenant, it's just an angel that God had sent. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And so we find the narrative continues. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. This is an interesting thing. We know historically for uh, historians like Philo that there was a large Jewish population in Egypt. There was about a million Jewish people who lived in Egypt. And we know that history all the way back. Even when the Jewish people under Moses came out, there were still people in that region because, you know, it's relatively close by. And so the reality is they went there, and it probably wasn't for a very long time. It probably wasn't years. It was probably more like uh, weeks or months because it didn't take very long for Herod to come to his demise. So we find this again. Verse 14, when he rose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And there was until the death of Herod, and there they were until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, and that was Hosea, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. And you know, we see that connection all the way back to God calling the Jewish people out of Israel, I mean out of Egypt, right, into the promised land. And Messiah, calls us out of this world system, which is symbolic also of Egypt. And so we find this moving on, that then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent forth to put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under. So he had all these baby boys, two years old and younger, massacred based on what he had determined from the wise men. Then this fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah. Lamentation weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And that re speaks back of the Babylonian captivity and what the Jewish people experienced. So that's the reality, folks, that tragedy that occurred. And here's what happened. Again, Herod met his demise rapidly. And here's the, the, the thinking. Can you imagine in his mindset? Because, by the way, Herod was, was a genius architecturally. He was also a madman. Sometimes geniuses are, right? He had a couple of his sons killed. He had a wife killed. Anybody he thought would be competition for his position as king, he had them taken out. But he knew, based on what the Magi said, he knew based on what the scribes and the priests had shared with him from the word of God about prophecy that Jesus was the coming Messiah. 
and he was willing and engaging and trying to kill him? Well, anybody that does something like that, they're not going to last too much longer, right? So he was dispatched. And so we find that the chapter 2 concludes this way. Now, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And uh, after Herod died, several of his sons started to reign over various regions of the area. And he knew Archelaus was brutal, so he didn't want to go there. But the Lord used all this to orchestrate where they needed to go. So we find that they were warned by God in a dream, and he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Remember all those wonderful pictures I've shown you guys about the region around the Galilee and Jesus' ministry there at Capernaum? And we'll talk more about that as we continue in, in Matthew in the coming weeks. So we find in verse 23, he concludes the chapter. And when he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, there's him saying that again, that it might be fulfilled. There was prophecy about the Messiah coming from Nazareth. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, which he shall, or shall be called a Nazarene. So as a conclusion of this chapter, folks, again, Jesus we find, by this point, he's, he's a little bit older, and they finally make their way as a young child up to Nazareth where he is going to grow up. And it's from this time in his life that he grows into adulthood. He grows in stature. He grows in wisdom. And the Lord is preparing him. His Father is preparing him for his messianic ministry. So it's there in this small village of Nazareth that, by the way, the rest of Israel, especially those in a metropolitan area, so to speak, like Jerusalem, they look down. They looked down on Nazareth. And it was like, oh, those hicks from Nazareth. It's like, it's like Salt Lake thinks of us, right? <laughs> oh, Vernal. Can anything good come from Vernal, right? <laughs> am, am I kidding, right? <laughs> so that was the mindset, that nothing good can come from Nazareth. That's why that was said in the Gospel of John. Can anything come from Nazareth that's any good? Here's the reality. God had plans. He had purposes. And it showed the amazing humility of Jesus Christ the second person of the Trinity, who was God come in the flesh, what he was willing to do 2,000 years ago, folks, in his humility to humble himself to the point that he would submit himself to be born, remember, in that manger, in the manger, right? With, and he was laid in a feeding trough. And, and all the stuff that goes with an environment like that, with, with cow and cow and sheep stuff and things, right? And the smells, all of that. There's the Messiah. There's God, Emmanuel. And then the trajectory is he grows up and he finds himself in Nazareth and he grows up to the point that his ministry would begin. So we find many years later in his adult life what we find in verse th chapter 3. So let's begin. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So we find fulfillment of prophecy in Isaiah about John the Baptist's ministry. And we know that John, right, was cousins with Jesus. We have that connection that we went with before. So here's this, what was considered by some to be almost like a wild guy. It defines how he was dressed, right? And he lived in the wilderness, ate locust, locusts and honey. And God had a unique ministry for him. By the way, John the Baptist was the final prophet of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament era, because it says in the Word that the prophets were until John. Because when Jesus came, folks, it was the beginning of a new covenant, a covenant of grace that God extends to His people. And folks, we have a living prophet, priest, and king who is seated on His throne, and His name is Jesus. Amen? So we don't need another earthly prophet prophet who says, I am the voice of God. We have Jesus himself, and we've got his living word and the Holy Spirit directing our lives. And so we find here again, John is preparing the way, though, for Jesus' introduction to the world and his ministry. So I want to pick it up moving forward here. Let's pick it up in verse 11. They're at the Jordan River in the Judean wilderness. It's very uh, desolate there, and we find this reality 
that as John is baptizing people at the Jordan River, again, looking at highlights, I indeed baptize you with water, John says, unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John is making some clarifications. Because there were thousands, folks. The, the historical record says that there may have been as many as a quarter of a million people that came to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. God was moving in the hearts of people to bring them to a place of, of repentance. And what does that mean? That word means to have a change of mind, then a change of heart, and a change of direction. That we recognize, man, I am on the wrong path, and I need to focus where God wants me to be. And God, I am sorry for living life on my own terms. Help me to follow you. And so when they came, their cultural reality was that they had mikvahs. This was ceremonial washings and baptisms. And so that water baptism didn't do anything in and of itself, but it was symbolic of the fact these people were dying to self and wanted to walk in the right way. Now, when John was doing that, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees had come. And those are the verses we see prior to this. And he calls them out and he said, you are a brood of vipers. He said, I, the Lord knows your hearts. You're not really here for the right purposes. If you really were, you would repent along with everybody else. You would identify with everyone else. You would humble yourselves. But then he tells and he declares, but there is one coming because he's come to prepare the way of the Lord, right? And when he comes, he is greater than him. And he said, I am not even worthy to loose his sandals. And he said that when he comes, and this is Jesus, he will baptize. But does he say he baptizes in water? No. There are seven baptisms in the Bible, folks. The word baptize, baptizo, simply means to immerse, to dip, or to overwhelm. So context is critical. John did a ceremonial baptism that Jewish people were involved in that was water-based. As Christians, we have what's called believer's baptisms, and we are dipped in water, immersed, but that's all symbolic of our recognition, understanding of Jesus' death, that we are dead in sin and we come up and we were given new life in Jesus at the point of our salvation. And the most important baptism we experience is at the moment that we are born again. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, the Holy Spirit immerses us, baptizes us into one body spiritually. That's the church, the body of Christ. That's the most important baptism. And folks, that's what he says. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit but also what? And fire. The fire part, you don't want to be involved in. You want to be baptized the Holy Spirit. You want to be born again. You want the Holy Spirit to indwell you. But the fire part, the next verse communicates what that's about. Verse 12, His winnowing fan is in His hand, and He will thoroughly clean out His threshing floor and gather His wheat into the barn. That's representative of those who come to know Him and are part of His kingdom and are filled with the Holy Spirit because they've been born again. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. For those who reject Jesus as Messiah, that's their destination. Very clear, it's not rocket science, right? So very, very powerful. So in the final verses here, and I'm not going to even try to get into chapter 4 today, we're going to focus here now on this amazing, uh, dramatic scene that we have right here. That it says in verse 13, that then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan, or to John at the Jordan, to be baptized by him. Now he came to be physically baptized in water. And folks, there were thousands of people around the area. And Jesus, again, sometimes there are movies that try to dramatize this. And, you know, it's, Jesus is pretty conspicuous. He really stands out. And, uh, you know, some of the old movies, it's almost like he's floating. Oh, you know, and there's a glow around him. Oh. <laughs> The reality was he would have been walking down through there looking like a Jewish man because Isaiah even prophesied that he wouldn't be so appealing that he would stand out. He was an everyday Jewish man in his flesh. But the Holy Spirit was with him and God was about to do something amazing and he came in absolute humility to be baptized. And we find in verse 14, and John, John the Baptist, tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? See, he was overwhelmed. He was amazed that knowing Jesus was Messiah, that he would ask him to baptize him. Verse 15, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It's the right thing. 
Jesus was about to begin his messianic ministry. And indeed, when he came up out of the water, that's when we see, as we'll read the text in a moment, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. That was the beginning of his messianic ministry in full, when he would begin to preach and to teach and to perform miracles for the next three years of his life. But another thing about this, when Jesus was baptized in water, he who knew no sin, according to 2 Corinthians 5, would become sin for us, right? So we could be made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. When Jesus was baptized in water, it was not only to fulfill all righteousness to begin his messianic ministry, but it was his identification with fallen humanity, that he came and he identified with us and was willing to die in our place so that when he was raised to new life after his crucifixion, that we too, when we place our faith in Jesus, spiritually, we are raised to new life in Jesus. Amen? So as we begin to wrap this up today, we find this, that when he had been baptized, when John had immersed him, and again, that word baptism, baptizo, bapto means to immerse, not sprinkle, means to immerse, and that was their culture. John, or Jesus, came up (coughs) immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God, that would be the Holy Spirit, descending, and it's now, look, it says like a dove. It doesn't say he was a dove. It said like a dove. So whatever that was, I don't know, but you know, we know that the Holy Spirit is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, or the dove is in the the Word of God. But it says he descended like a dove, and in lightning upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So what an amazing scene, right? Can you imagine that Jesus comes up out of the water? The Holy Spirit comes upon him to really, in a sense, it's an anointing in his messianic ministry. Folks, you and I, apart from abiding in Jesus, apart from the Holy Spirit indwelling us and empowering us, you and I can't do anything for God that has any eternal value. It has to be the Lord on us and in us and through us to be an authentic work of God. And we need that. In Jesus' earthly ministry, when he humbled himself, and according to Philippians 2, and it said he set aside his, his divine attributes, he didn't cease being God, but in a sense, he didn't rely on his attributes as God. When he said, take up your cross and follow me, if Jesus would have lived that messianic life in his deity and operate in his deity we can't take up our cross and follow him in that he identified completely in our humanity and he was dependent in his flesh in his humanity for the holy spirit and the father to direct him to empower him that's why he prayed all the time what a great model for us right and god used him in an amazing ways. so here we have the trinity we have the son himself second person of the trinity who had humbled himself, took upon flesh. He comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends upon him, and we hear the voice of the Father. Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And he said what? This is my one and only unique Son. There's none other like Jesus Christ. You and I become children of God when we become born again. We accept Jesus, our Lord and Savior, but there's only one unique Son of God like Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh. Amen? How powerful is that? So those are highlights from the first three chapters. I want the worship team to come up. And next week, we're going to go chapters 4 through 8, and we'll be able to conclude that. We had extra stuff today going, talking about missions and other stuff too, so we have no problem. But I encourage you, folks, as a refresher, read through chapters 4 through 8. There's some amazing stuff in there. The Sermon on the Mount is chapters 5 through 7. It's so rich, so powerful. So let's pray as we go back to a time of of worship. Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you, God. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, revisit these wonderful chapters, Lord, that we had gone so in-depth on before this fall. And Lord, it refreshes and stirs our remembrance of the things that we studied, God, and so thankful that we have this privilege to continue this journey, Lord. And I pray that today, even with some of the familiarity of this text, God, that your Lord, because it's living and powerful, that it's meeting hearts right now, Lord, Lord, you know each of our lives. You know exactly what we need from you, Jesus. We need more of you, Jesus. That's what we really need. Greater depth of relationship, a greater growing dependence upon you, Lord, a greater faith and trust in you, Lord. And Father, as we continue just in this time of worship, truly meet every heart where they're at, Lord, the uniqueness of their lives, their needs, Lord. And we thank you that you are our provider, God. You are our source. You're all that we need, Jesus. 
So as we turn our attention back to a time of singing your praises and of prayer, Lord, just meet people where they're at. If they can use this time, if you, uh, if you direct them to simply pray right where they're at. Lord, those of you compelled to worship, Lord, they'll worship. If there's somebody who needs uh, somebody to pray for them, our elders are available in the entry just to come alongside them and to wrap their arm around them and to love them and to pray for them, Lord. So we just entrust this continuing time, Lord, into your hands. So with our eyes closed and our hearts open, Lord, we quiet ourselves for a moment. Lord, just speak to our hearts even now in Jesus' name. stood before creation eternity
him up church worship him so I stand
gave your all for us. Lord, our reasonable response to give our lives back to you, Jesus, a living sacrifice to be your heart and your hands and your feet, Lord, the joy of loving you, the joy of serving you, God. It's such an amazing blessing. And God, as we leave this place today, Lord, we know that you want us to take the things that we've learned, Lord. You want us to, to go from this place, God, and be effective in this world for you to be your heart and your hands and your feet. So give us the courage, Lord, to be used of you. And thank you, God, that you don't expect us to do it in and of ourselves. Lord, it's you in and through us, Lord. So fill us with your Holy Spirit. Empower us by your grace just to be the people you've called us to be, Lord. So we thank you again for this amazing opportunity we've had today. We look forward to the opportunities that lie before us as well, Lord. We just give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty, awesome, and matchless name. Amen. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. As he shines upon you, let him shine in and through and out of you so that wherever you go, people will see Jesus, the light of the world. Guys, have a great day. Remember, all the Calvary Connection small groups are back on track. You can go to the Facebook page. And if you haven't liked that, please do that. It's an electronic bulletin board. We uh, keep everybody up to speed on things there and devotional material, all kinds of stuff for you guys so you can grow. So God bless you.